Andy, thank you for that incredible presentation, detailed presentation. I want to open up for questions. I want to start with a question, and if you don't mind repeating the question sure. that you get from the audience for the camera. So I'm going to play devil's advocate because you know and I know very well that anybody who goes out in the public and speaks openly and honestly about Sharia law and Islamist Jew hatred gets called an Islamophobe. Right. And you said in the beginning of your presentation, you, you just don't understand why people are, aren't speaking openly about it. Now, my answer to that would be because there is a, a systematic campaign to deceive the public as to what Islamism is that we don't understand the theological, theological motivations behind the threat of Islamist terrorism. And you see that from the US government. ISIS is not Islamic, the Taliban is not a terrorist group, Shirley Hebdo was not carried out by Islamists, and so forth. And then you always get also a, a moderate Muslim that comes on television and says, this is not my Islam. Right. So, what are the responses to that when you have someone that we respect very much, like Kanta Ahmed or Dr. Zudi Jasser, who go on television, who try very hard to, um, I don't know, spark a reform of Islam, so to speak, given that they don't have a following like Khomeini does or, or the Al-Azhar University does, should we not support them in their reformation? How do we do so while at the same time speaking honestly about literal Islam? Right. I think that the, you've got the key in the last point there. I, I, think, I think it's up to us, actually, to create the space. And, and, and my criticism wasn't leveled. Um, you you, 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 you um, made the very important point that, that there is this Islamophobia industry, and you could spell it with F-A-U-X. Um, you know, to, to demonize those who 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 want to try and address these issues honestly, whether they're whether they're non-Muslims, or or secular Muslims, or apostate Muslims, or whomever they are, now, you're absolutely right about that. I actually was talking about what I think is a more insidious uh, problem, which which I find, frankly, even amongst conservatives, where there there there's still the whole idea that. Um, Islamic anti-Semitism is a borrowed phenomenon from Christianity, from you know post-Christianity, um, and I, I, that, that's really why why I put together the legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism. And I'm still baffled. Uh, you know, there was just I just think it was an absolutely appalling long op-ed by Rabbi Sachs this past weekend. Um, which, which was in a pure state of denial, that this is a sui generis phenomenon of, of the post-Ottoman Empire. I mean, he's talking about 19, this just evolved after 1922. I mean, so I guess that was more the thrust of, of my personal criticism. So, so but, but, my, but it does apply to what you said, Brooke, because if, if we could at least get to, to the stage of where as non-Muslims, and we're perfectly entitled to this, whether it's, whether it's the anti-Christian themes in Islam, as Christians, it, whether it's the anti-Semitic themes in Islam, as Jews, we are perfectly entitled to talk about it in ways that 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 relate it to the Islamic sources, to Islamic historical behavior, and I think that's incumbent upon us. I think if we do a better job with that and deal with that more honestly and more factually and more <coughs> categorically, I hope we will create space for real uh, Muslim reformers, whether they still consider themselves to be Muslims or, or whether they consider themselves to be free thinkers who by accident of birth were born into Islamic societies and are entitled to their own patrimony, how they interpret it. I mean, I'm talking about people like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Ibn Warak uh, and Wafa Sultan. They cons Wafa considers herself a Syrian. Uh, Ibn Warak considers himself, you know, well, he was pre-partitioned India, but, you know, of the Indian subcontinent. Ayan considers herself, to some degree, African. I mean, you know, they're entitled to that heritage, too, and they have a different vision for how they would have liked their societies to be and how they might be in the future. So I think we create the space for all these people, whether they consider themselves Muslims or not religiously, but come from these Islamic societies, by ourselves speaking about these issues uh, honestly, and hope that they will join us. Uh, that, that's, I don't know how else to, to frame it. Yes, uh, Judy? Um, these are very difficult issues to talk about, and they can get just so far 
but they can't go further. And it's Jonathan Sachs's article, which I thought was fantastic until the very end. And at the very end, I mean, it was very good in, in terms of summation, but, and I've been trying to email him, he cannot, he, he had a, a recent piece on, uh, to Muslims, take back your religion. Take back your religion. I emailed him, I said, what is it that you think they're taking back? For in my neighborhood, I mean, they are inviting members of mosque to come and speak, and they are perpetrating such a false, I, um, I, I saw uh, Daisy Khan on CNN the other night saying what was and was not in the Quran. The only thing I could say is I, I think it starts with being honest about what the sources are. Uh, again, um, you know, there isn't in any civilization a universal application of such dogma. Never. None. But the, 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 the rather consistent application of it has demand, has and had demonstrable consequences. And we have to be willing uh, to talk about this. You know, my mentor, my main mentor was Batya Orr, uh, Gis Giselle Littman. And she, t she told me, she's written about this honestly. You know, she basically lived uh, in the Nasser period, um, you know, sort of a modern variant of a Dimi's existence in Egypt. And she didn't even understand it herself until after she got out, and David was involved with a Mossad operation to get Jewish children uh, out of Morocco, and she was posing as a as a um, as the wife of a of an Anglican minister, and she so she she could be back as a British citizen and free of all the constraints of the Sharia mores or the actual law, and she looked at the people, the North African Moroccan Jews, and she understood finally the mentality that this engenders in them, that this kind of chronic oppression, even if it isn't physical violence all the time, engenders in them. And so I, I think these are the phenomena that we have to be honest about. And I, I don't hear it coming from many quarters. I, I, I just don't. And I think it's up to Again, I think it's up to the individual populations. I think it's up to Hindus to speak about this. I think it's up to Christians to speak about this. We heard some more with the Christians in particular with, with, with the ravages of, of, uh, of the Islamic State. Um, but I, I don't see where else it begins. Yes, so. We always think that if we educate the world about the anti-Semitism that rid its ugly head again, we think people are going to be disgusted and shocked. How can this happen so soon after the Holocaust? But we have to assume that people scratch the surface and they're anti-Semitic. People don't care That's about right. this. Everything you just said is fascinating and every Jew should be privy and knowledgeable about what you've just said. But it's not going to resonate with anyone. We have to change the story. Forget about the anti-Semitism of the Quran. It doesn't apply to anyone except us. No one cares. No, no, no. But but that's why that's why. It, no, you're right. Uh, but but I but I am tying it in to the general look. In Iran, uh, the Zoroastrians have long argued, uh, particularly that was the indigenous culture before the Muslim conquests, and it's effectively was wiped out and sort of transferred to to Mumbai of all places, uh, and that's. I think where the largest uh, uh, remnants of the Zoroastrian community are, there's, there's some tiny remnants still in Iran. Um, but but uh, they, they argued that the application, for example, of Najis was at least as severe towards them. And, 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 and they're right. I mean, they're, they're right. And, and, and the idea that, that Iran wants to wage a global jihad is obviously not just against Jews. But there's, there's really no getting away from the little Satan, big Satan. It, it really does mean a lot to annihilate the Jews, particularly since they're gathered in one place now, and, and then move on to, to global conquest. We, we, we can't ignore that. But you're right in a sense that, that you know, the, the, the jihad depredations historically and in real time now uh, affect all these populations. So I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, Wait, to Sophie's so, point, so in your book, there's a list of all the uh, uh, Quranic and Hadith sources of Jew hatred. Where is there a similar list of the Quranic sources to kill the infidel? Does that exist? Do you have that? In the in in the, in the first book that I wrote on jihad, it's very it's very general um, in terms of, of the of the jihad uh, uh, regulations for for all the all the all the non-Muslims. 
Um, but but there but there there are uh, there are like for example Quran 9:5 really has nothing to do with Jews or Christians. It's very much targeted towards pagans, um, and and uh, and that would be um, you know animists, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. Um, but but the but the system of the Sharia applies to all non-Muslims, and uh, you know you're right, Sophie. We we can we can never forget that. Um, but the, theologically, there is a centrality to the Jews, and we can't escape that either. I remember the reason that I went on. I was going after I wrote the Legacy of Jihad. I was going to do a, a, um, a more expanded treatment on on the application of the Sharia in detail to all these non-Muslim po populations, and and I was researching the Hindus, and I came across uh, this discussion. Uh, there was a period, a very interesting period in in um, in the in the Mughal uh, uh, era, where Akbar, who who was a, a pious Muslim jihadist ruler, wound up becoming more or less a Hindu um, uh, Muslim syncretist. Abolished the jizya, the, this this Quranic poll tax, uh, introduced uh, unheard of uh, reforms, um, and the the Muslim clerics wrote up and uh, rose up and wrote these. Horrific polemics, anti-Hindu polemics, etc. But in this anti-Hindu polemic, which I could understand from their perspective, it was it was upsetting their entire world order, and it was being by, done by one of them. Um, it's there's a line by Sir Hindi, who's a Sufi. Uh, again, where Sufis are New Age, etc. He says he says uh, um, uh, whenever a Jew is killed, it is for the benefit of Islam, and and that just stopped. He, this I, I researched him. He he never met a Jew. He never. There was no contact with Jews. And so it got me shifted onto the anti-Semitism book because I wanted to understand where this could, this, this, at least the theological animus, you know, came from. So you're absolutely right. We can't dissociate um, uh, and, and, and harp too much on, on the plight of, of Jews. And, and, and in fact, and in fact that's, that's, why, that's why Batya Orr's major work to this day remains the decline of Eastern Christianity under Islam. She, she saw that. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry, the guy in the back was... The title of your book is Iran's Final Solution for Israel. And I didn't hear that. Now, for you years what? and years... What? I'm sorry, well, I don't understand what you didn't hear. I didn't hear the answer to your book, Iran's Final Solution for I, I was Israel giving the theological today, basis not for in 1427. I guess I'm not getting the whole thing. Their nuclear weapons program is for the destruction of Israel. Yeah. I, I didn't make that clear no, at the beginning? Yeah, right, right. The question is, should Iran get a nuke, or if they already have it, how does that change the equation in the Middle East? What is the threat to Because the, okay, the, the threat to Israel is that uh, if, if you read uh, Professor Lou Barris's analysis of, of, a, of a nuclear holocaust, one, one, one successful strike. If you read it from Matt Kronig, whose book I promoted here as well, it's, it's horrific. It, the, the society can't really survive that. That's, that's the consequence of one. The other problem is that it emboldens all of Iran's surrogates to do all kinds of nefarious things, whether it's conventional rockets, uh, rocket attacks under the umbrella of, of, a, of, a, of a nuclear threat, or it's, it's, it's what would be the biggest suicide operation in the history of Islam would be to somehow figure out a, 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 a suicide operation that involved nukes. So I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. Yes. Uh, traditionally, in this country, there's been bipartisan support, extensively bipartisan support of Israel. And in light of this latest pissing match over the BB invite, and I'm not about to point fingers as to which party screwed up on this thing, but are we witnessing the demise of bipartisan support in Israel, for Israel in this country? Look, I, I thought it was incredible the statement that Menendez made, the original statement. I, I, he had a flash of, of, of this searing honesty where he said that, you know, I, I hear the administration, I guess I'm paraphrasing, that they're essentially, they're essentially repeating the talking points of the Iranian regime. I couldn't believe I heard that coming out of an important Democratic senator. 
Um, and yet, within, within a few days, there was this talk of, uh, well, let's give them a few more months and see what we have by March and, you know, not to push things. Um, and in the end, I just find it a lot of blather about sanctions. Well, I, I will say I was at a conference. I don't think it matters. I, I was at a conference, um, uh, and it was actually in the Capitol building. It was kind of, kind of neat. Uh, that was held, um, albeit in the basement, in a conference room. Um, and, and at least Trent Franks showed up and gave a, a really, really frightening discussion. Um, he held up a book, uh, I think it was originally in Farsi, and then it went into French, and he got it translated. But it was, it was a proud discussion of how the Iranians are working on a, a nuclear detonation. This is for America. This is not even for Israel, necessarily. A nuclear detonation in the atmosphere that would, that would be an, an electromotive pulse. But but this was this was like this was like a proud announcement, and apparently the National Defense Institute, one of its translation services, had translated it. And Trent Franks is saying, you know, he's holding it up. He says, "This isn't secret. This is just a publication where they're proudly announcing that this is this is the fruits of their research. That 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 they want to be able to do this." And then you see these reports of, of, of uh, very anodyne vessels in the Caspian Sea, you know, launching rockets that go straight up. And you go, well, gee, maybe, maybe they really are doing these experiments. Um, so, so that's why, and getting back to Sophie's point, I, I, I think this is not, and when you see an ICBM, that's, that range is way beyond Israel. They're, they're, they, they appear to be serious about this stuff. Right. Now, a question for you, and this is... Um this would be sort of like in the best case scenario. Uh, we see Iran expanding its tentacles in Yemen, obviously the Assad back regime, and elsewhere, Lebanon. Uh, and then you obviously have Sunni forces as well. Do you see there being a massive Sunni Shia conflagra conflagration where, sort of like the Iran Iraq war the first time, where they sort of kill each other and Israel isn't caught in the crosshairs, and that actually works to Israel and the West benefit? Uh, now that it's so close to Israel, uh, in, in Syria, and then you saw these events that took place in, near, on or near the Golan itself, you begin to say that, gee, maybe, maybe it's, it, 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 it wouldn't be sort of self-contained and, and there'd be tremendous uh, 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 deterioration of both odious sides, uh, that, that, that somehow there's, there's, there's enough spillover that we could see real problems, and, you're, and, and I think we're getting uh, a sort of a, a frightening foretaste of that with, with Hezbollah now, too. So I, 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 I but, you know, ge geostrategic analysis like that is, is not my bag, uh, and, and, but it, it looks a little frightening to me. I, again, like when it, was, when it was focused in Iraq and we were dealing with these horrific scenes of, of, of the attacks on, on, um, on the Yazidis and the Christians and, and, uh, and, and, and the, the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and uh, supporting uh, the, the uh, Iraqi regime against, uh, against ISIS. Um, it, 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 I think it's spread, it, it spread too far to, to say that that, that, that would be um, the, 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 the most likely, uh, likely outcome. Um, uh, but but uh, uh, it, I, I, I think it also, it underscores one thing that, that Again, it, it just struck me, uh, and I, I can't emphasize enough to, to, to read Matt's book because, again, he's counsel on foreign relations. This guy has, has brass cojones to do what he's done. Uh, counsel on foreign relations, Georgetown University associate professor, I pray to God he has tenure. Um, and, and, and yet, it's such a, it's a pellucid analysis as to why these aren't good options. It's just about all that's left. Just do something, and then what he points out—that's that's actually quite remarkable—is that uh, I guess it's, it's different if you look at if you look at Nazi Germany, um, and that was you know unbelievably massive ordnance and U.S. Brits, etc. They never got to produce nuclear weapons, and the regime dissolved. If you look at actually at least temporarily Iraq during the Iraq-Iran War, knocked out a, a primordial I Iranian facility. Israel, of course, you know, knocked out uh, Iraq's facility in Osirak. Israel again in 2007, uh, even under the generally feckless uh, Omer, managed to, he managed to gird his loins and take out the Iraqter in Syria. Until we heard these recent reports that something's going on again in Syria, 
that, that gave us a temporary hiatus. So what Matt points out is that every time this has been done, it's, it's, it's delayed a nuclear program, in some cases, indefinitely. And I think that is the historical record. Um, so, and, and also when I learned, not being a, 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 a tactical military person, that between B-52 launched cruise missiles and this massive ordnance penetrator from B-2s, this entire campaign to destroy uh, uh, Iraq, which is the plutonium facility, and I believe that's above ground, um, the, the uh, uranium ore processing facility in Isfahan, which is also above ground, and that even the two hardened sites, uh, the one at Comb Fordow is very deep, it's about 300 feet deep with reinforced concrete, uh, the one in Tanz is another uranium enrichment facility, that's, that's about 70 feet. That could all be done in an evening of bombing and combined bombing and missile strikes. And Kronig estimates that that would be at least a five-year delay. And again, given the historical record, potentially uh, indefinitely. Now, what he says about Israel is that Israel can get rid of the, 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 the surface sites. So, so uh, Iraq and the, and the ore processing facility in, in, um, in uh, Isfahan, it could do significant damage to the the, the Natanz facility, which is about 70 feet deep, it can't do anything about Comb Fordo given given known uh, current capabilities. But but those strikes, he says, could delay the program at least a couple of years. Um, again, this is beyond my area of expertise, but that sounds reasonable given the alternative, uh, which is that you know we'll have this feckless pursuit of policy. You'll, you'll see that graph of the Iranian enrichment. God knows what else is going on that we don't, we have no idea about. Um, and that's why Matt reluctantly was willing to give me that quote for a piece I wrote back in the fall after the extension was announced. Yes, yes. Okay. This is all horrific, and as you know, I know a great deal of it already. But what really alarmed me is last week learning that the State Department has released already $400 million of frozen assets to Iran and plans to give them $11 billion. So basically, so we're bankrolling this too. we are bankrolling this operation, which is what they're going to call it. How, what can we do? I know this is not your, but what can we do? Yes, to, Brooke. <laughs> No, no, seriously, I, I, it's a political thing. I, 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 I don't, I'm, I, I don't, I don't pretend to have any knowledge how to deal with politicians. Uh, I, I, I'm not the most politically correct person to be dealing with that, to giving advice to do that. But, but yeah, it's, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge problem. Yes. Do you think that El Sisi, who, do you think that El Sisi, who seems incredibly brave to go to Al Ansar, has a shot at actually changing Islam by? by no. saying, let's clean up the Koran and get rid of the abrogated the verses, uh, verses so that it's well, easier to Well, if he said that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yep. a far cry from that. I, I, I know this is, uh, um, I know this is against the, uh, the popular meme, but um, I, I actually analyzed CeCe's uh, War College thesis. Uh, you know, I had to get it, believe it or not, by a FOIA request. I mean, this is something that we pay for uh, when, when these, you know, uh, Muslim, Military folks come and train in our uh, military academies, but anyway, he, he put he, they produce these mini theses. I don't know you call it a term paper by our standards, but um, uh, one of his colleagues put his online immediately. Uh, who's still a general, General so Sop uh, Soki, and it had you know boilerplate anti-Westernism, anti-Americanism, et cetera, et cetera. I was shocked when I couldn't just find CC's, uh, and and the library wouldn't release it to me. I eventually teamed up with um, with the uh, with uh, um, uh, the the, the, the um, what, what is it the the, the legal uh, they do a lot of hey, judicial FOIA watch. requests judicial watch I'm sorry judicial watch judicial watch and we got it quickly um, it's, it's American pulp, taxpayer property uh, we got it and it was it was a very interesting ambivalent alarming document to read where. He was singing the praises of the caliphate system. Now you could wow. say, well, but you could say, look, this is a romantic, you know, Muslim view of, of a system that we might not find so romantic. But but um, and so I was willing to give him a little bit of a pass on that, although it was a cause for concern. What was consistent and what was to me more alarming is that he was and remains so I think uh, demonstrate that 
virulently anti-secular. He is opposed to the kind of secular. He is opposed to the kind of Western secular consensus that the Brits tried to bequeath to Egypt to try and make it so that they could create a, pl a truly pluralistic society. They have rejected it ever since the 1923 Constitution, at least, and CC ain't going there. Um, he's orchestrated on his watch, not, not a sort of residual from Morsi. You could make that argument. Oh, well, Morsi set things in place. No, he's, he's orchestrated a new campaign to, quote, extirpate atheism in Egypt. Now, why, you ask? Well, he was told by uh, Al-Azhar um, uh, that there's a terrible plague of atheism in Egypt. Why? I had my kids do the math on this. It was a good math problem for them when we were dri was driving them home from school. I said, kids, we'll round off the numbers. There's actually 866 atheists, according to Al-Azhar, in Egypt. Egypt's population is 82 and a half million. I want you to round off the 866 to 800, and you tell me what percentage that is. And they go, oh, that's easy, Pop. That's 0 0.001%. I, I, you know, and, and so, I mean, 0.001% is a national tragedy. He's also done nothing to stem the tide of, of, of prosecutions, not just persecutions, uh, for blasphemy, which obviously targets the Copts. Uh, in, in Egypt. On the other hand, I mean, you know, geostrategically, uh, he's, he's in a battle with arch jihadists, very violent ones that could not only threaten him but threaten Israel. So that's certainly a good thing. Uh, but that to me is a separate question from him as being a transformative figure that's going to uh, change Islam. You know, it was very revealing. Memory, memory had, it's, it, it's piecemeal. I don't know if anyone can find it, please send it to me. I cannot find the entire speech that he gave on New Year's Day. Um, I just see different clips of it. And Memory had a very interesting piece, which was sort of complementary to these other pieces that are out there, where he literally turns to Grand Imam Al Tayeb and mentions something, you know, good Grand Imam. Uh, uh, I forget exactly how he puts it, uh, but. It, it, it's, it's suggested that he wants him to do something, but for heaven's sake, this is a guy, Grand Imam al Tayeb, who, who succeeded uh, Tantawi, who I quoted earlier with that magnum opus and it's just ugly, ugly Jew hatred. Grand Imam Tantawi has done very concrete things recently that he could have called him out on. For example, uh, in the fall, he said that the conflagrations going on in the Middle East and, and the horrors inflicted by ISIS are all the fault of a global Zionist conspiracy. Yeah. Now, he could have said, Grand Imam, please, we, we, you know, these kinds of things. We, we, we can't say these things anymore. Let's, 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 we, we have problems, but it's not global Zionism. Let's, let's start dealing you know, with, with our own issues, etc. Something, some example, more concretely, and of course he never would have done this, is that Al Tayeb, a year before he claims that you know, Zionism, Jewry, is responsible for, for uh, ISIS, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, the, and the conspiracies to divide the Muslim world, that's how we put it. That was October of this year, so September, October of 2013, I'm sorry, 2014, of 2013, he gives an interview and he quotes Quran 582, which says that you know, the Jews are the, are the, uh, have, harbor the greatest hatred for the Muslims. It's sort of classic psychological projection. And of course, it's used in, in, in turn to justify hatred of, of, of the Jews. Um, Al Tayeb gives an interview, just calmly, matter of factly, no high pitched voice or anything, says, Yes, well, this is, this, is our, this is the legacy that the Quran teaches us. This is the problem that we've been dealing with for 1,400 years. You know, it's the, sa the same then, the same now. It's the same problem. The, the, the Quran defines it for us. This is what we have to be aware of. So there are concrete things that he could have said. And so, you know, again, it's open. It, it's ambivalent. It's open to interpretation. Geopolitically, uh, I don't have any problem with what he's doing. I don't think that we, we have we turned a blind eye to him waging a campaign against what we, as Westerners at least, appropriately respect as our most fundamental freedoms, freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. That's not a minor, that's not a minor blemish on someone's uh, uh, record and actions. So I don't think he gets any pass on that. 
On the other hand, you know, if he's going to go back to sort of a more Mubarak way of dealing, you know, with, with international relations and stability issues, obviously there's nothing wrong with that. Andy, let's take one more question. Sure. Um, but if you could also address um, using the term jihad, there's a debate on that because what it means is holy war. And even though when we say jihad, we know what we mean as, as a violent conquest against the infidel. But the literal translation is holy war. So do we want to keep repeating holy war, holy war, or do we have well, another name well, for it? Well, actually, actually, my dear host, I do have to say, it, it, it is, it, it, if you look, if you look at the root of the word um, and all its usages in the Quran, um, it, it, it does mean struggle. So it can, it can mean, uh, uh, it can mean nonviolent struggle. The way, the way it is used, um, and there are different uh, sort of philological uh, uh, analyses of this, but, but, but two that are very good, that look carefully, um, uh, indicated that there are somewhere between 35 and 40 usages of the root of the word in the Quran. Um, and with the exception of, of, of uh, one in particular and maybe two or three others where it's more elusive, it all means violent struggle. And then, of course, you have the jurists over the years that formulated it into this doctrine of warfare. So certainly we shouldn't be silenced into submission. Oh, then of course, the other, the other chestnut that they'll bring out is that Muhammad talked about the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. And of course, the lesser jihad, quote unquote, is violent warfare. And the greater jihad is this spiritual turning inward. Of course, just to become a better Muslim, really, is what it, is what it means. It turns out, that, and this is why the fundamentalists are so important to read, is that they don't like that stuff. First of all, it's a Sufi notion, and they have researched it, and then independent Western scholars have followed up on their inside Muslim baseball research. And there's no canonical hadith where Muhammad ever says that. It's sort of a Sufi tradition that doesn't exist in the six canonical collections of hadith. However, and I first learned this from Syed Qutb, of all people, and then I confirmed it on my own, because I don't want to trust Syed Qutb because he's an evil fundamentalist. But, but, but it turns out there's a canonical hadith in Sahih Muslim, which is the second most important collection of hadith, where the priority is exactly the opposite. Jihad warfare is first, uh, you know, preaching about jihad is, is second, and yes, this, this, this idea of, 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 uh, of, of just doing things sort of in a, in a passive, nonviolent way uh, or an inward way is the, is, the, is the least, it says in the hadith, the least respected form uh, of jihad. Wait, which so hadith was it? Uh, it's in Sahih Muslim. I, I, I can send me an email, I'll, I'll, I'll track it down for you. Okay. I, I have it. I have All right. It. But, but, but so, so, so yes, we absolutely should not give any quarter on, on this idea that certainly as, as brought forward by the jurists, including modern jurists, that, that jihad for practical purposes, certainly for non-Muslims, is, is warfare against the infidel. Okay. Okay. okay, one more. All right, now I actually, I got a copy of your book from uh, Frank Gaffney's event, and I've been reading through it, and right off the bat, you have this story about this, uh, this imaginary fatwa that, that, uh, that prohibits nuclear weapons. Now, where in the world did they did they come up with this? It's almost classic, uh, classic John Kerry. Uh, oh. uh, just to, just <laughs> basically, what he's talking about is that uh, right after the original P P five plus one was announced in uh, November of, of 2013, November 24th of 2013, um, and even in the weeks leading up to it, Kerry would go. Ayatollah Khomeini has written a fatwa that prohibits right. nuclear weapons <laughs> development. Uh, I, I, I've seen the fatwa, I know, he would go <laughs> blather on and on about it. First of all, there is no written fatwa. Now, one thing you can accuse the Iranian clerics of, uh, that you can't accuse them of, is, is not being prolific <laughs> in, in writing fatwas. So if he wanted to write a fatwa that prescribed the use of nuclear weapons, he would write, uh, he could write a fatwa to that effect. Um, it turns out, and, even, and, and again, the fact checker from, from the Washington Post, Glenn Kessler, looked into this, and he felt that it was basically a fatuous claim. Because it, it, it turns out that 
uh, you know, over the years, Khamenei has verbaled some statements, um, but essentially there's no written fatwa whatsoever. And in fact, even his statements have evolved towards uh, it, 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 stockpiling weapons, potentially, but he hasn't come out and saying actually using them. And then, of course, uh, when you combine uh, even his uh, public statements, uh, which, which are pro-stockpiling, with his statements about, uh, endlessly about the annihilation of Israel with the cancer metaphors and things like that, you have to say, this is, this is pretty thin gruel uh, altogether. All, all but, but, but again, even the Washington Post fact checker, Glenn Kessler, fe felt that basically that, that was a pretty fatuous claim. Thank you. Oh, thank you.